Thank you, Jane. Our last session is a panel of bus advocacy campaigns who will give a brief overview of the work that has occurred in their cities or shire. Each panelist will speak for five minutes and we will go to questions after they have all spoken. At the end of the session, I will ask the panelists to provide a short or perhaps three words takeaway advice for our audience. So I will start with Councillor Adele Hegadich, Mayor of Wyndon. Councillor Hegadich is a lawyer, businesswoman, long-time Wyndon resident, and is serving her third term as councillor at Wyndon City Council and has been elected mayor for 2020-21. She previously served from 2009 to 2016 and served as mayor for the council in 2015-16. Councillor Hectich is council's Healthy City portfolio holder, which is working to implement initiatives, programs, services that create a better, healthier place for all residents, regardless of their age, gender, cultural background, and social economic status. Welcome, Councillor Hegetich. Over to you now. Thank you, and uh, thank you to everyone for being here today. So, um, as, uh, as I've been introduced, I am the Wyndham City Mayor, and my presentation is about We Love Buses. Next slide, please. So just a bit of background about Wyndham City. Wyndham City is home to about 30,000 residents and we're expected to grow to over 500,000 by 2040. Wyndham City covers an area of 542 kilometres square and we feature 27.4 kilometres of coastline bordering Port Phillip to the east. In terms of our growth, our population alone could fill three MCGs to the brim. We're one of the fastest growing municipalities in the country. We have around 14 babies born each day to a Wyndham mother, which is equivalent to about four and a half primary school classes each week. One in three people has moved into Wyndham in the past five years and almost half of our residents were born overseas. 50% of our population speaks a language other than English. 58% of our residents are aged 30, under 35 and more than half of our households are households of families with children. In the pre-COVID days, seven in 10 workers left our city daily to access employment and most drove a car to get to work. While we have a high number of essential workers, it will be interesting to see what changes will come when we come, go to a COVID normal work life and importantly, the impact this will have on our transport system. Next slide, please. In terms of our transport story, it is worth to note that we are a big, diverse city with lots of differing land uses. We also have a high car dependency and latent demand for public transport. It's important to understand that the, pub, that the transport experience of our local community, including challenges and key priorities. Our last annual community satisfaction survey provided insights for our community. I note that, however, that these results may have been impacted by COVID, but uh, the results showed that 82% of Wyndham workers travelled to work by car, which was an increase from 77% the year before. There was a decline in the use of public transport to 15.5% in 2020. Interestingly, though, we found that there was a higher public transport use in our new growth areas, including Williams Landing and Wyndham Vale, and this was mostly by young people aged 18 to 44. When it comes to buses, pre-COVID, 47% of our residents and the respondents stated they regularly use buses and the reasons for not using buses including the buses don't go to where they want them to go and there was no bus route near their home. Some examples of poor access to public transport are related to the rate of residential growth in new states such as Truganina, Tarnit, Manor Lakes and Wyndham Vale, where dwellings were beyond 400 metres of an existing public transport bus route. There's no doubt that the daily exodus out of Wyndham to access employment impacts our network and livability. The future of our city requires more local jobs and a rethink of the public transport system to respond to this. We're already seeing people travel in different ways across our cities in response to COVID, 
as well as working from home and flexible working arrangements. So currently, Council is tracking its Active Transport Missing Links program to ensure we're doing all we can from our end. Next slide, please. In regards to bus changes, we've had a lot going on. So the PTV undertook a bus route review and reorganised the network to provide more direct routes to coincide with the opening of the regional rail link in June 2015 and introduced new bus interchanges at Tarnit and Windervale stations. Since 2015, there have been a couple of minor route extensions and in May this year, two new bus routes were introduced. The 21 state budget allocated funding towards new and extended routes in Tarnate North. As a result of this, we have had some of the top productive routes in Melbourne, which tells us that there is a huge demand for bus services in Wyndham. Having said this though, we still have communities that are not yet serviced. Windbus is a community-led group. Uh, it runs on-demand bus services, which was a trial uh, and launched in 2019 in, in Point Cook. Windbus is led by a very passionate local resident, St Hill. The trial provided demand responsive services by an online booking for services from Point Cook to Hoppers Crossing train station. St Hill continues to look for opportunities and has partnered with the local developer to deliver a new trial in Tarnate. A few months back, however, because of COVID, uh, this was paused. We would love to see more demand responsive services in our city and a hybrid of fixed routes, as well as on demand, which we believe would work well and is a worthy of review and consideration, particularly in light of the new way of living and working as mentioned earlier. Most recently, we have had three level crossing removal projects and the Western Roads upgrade package in construction across our network. Next slide, please. When we look to the future, we need to make sure we understand what our community wants. Earlier this year, Council undertook an extensive deliberative engagement process to refresh the Wyndham 2040 community vision. While this engagement was place-based, a consistent priority which emerged from all places was our community wants more choice when it comes to transport options, and buses are an important mix. Residents in Tanen Traganina went a step further to say that they want to see demand responsive services. This shows our community doesn't necessarily want to use their car as a, as a default, as they genuinely want and need more sustainable and integrated transport options to get around. Further to this, our council plan, which will be adopted shortly, commits us to delivering and advocating for a quality, sustainable and accessible transport network that enables the community to move around the city easily. So, of course, buses are very much front and centre for our council. To inform the future, we are also looking at any smart city initiatives and opportunities relating to data to gain a deeper understanding of how our community is moving around, where they are going and by which mode, etc. As we emerge from COVID restrictions, we will be interesting to watch and we'll see what's happening and whether more people will come back to PT. Um, next slide, please. While the regional rail link was one of the key drivers for the bus review in Wyndham, we also held the Get Wyndham Moving campaign from 2014 to 2016. And this played a significant role in highlighting the daily challenges and congestion our community was facing and the lack of viable choices. The campaign helped put our community issues front and centre, including the need for a review of bus services and the bus routes that were needed. At the time of the Get Window Moving campaign, more than 16,000 households were more than 400 metres from a bus route. The reorganisation of bus routes reduced the number of dwellings to around 6,000. Reflecting the changing nature of growth areas, the value of more frequent route reviews into the future is self-evident. Since then, Council has continued developing budget submissions, meetings with MPs, uh, and PTV DOT officers to continue to advocate for improved public transport provision for our community. But we're not doing it alone. Recently, the Friends of the Earth launched a campaign, Better Buses for the West. The campaign wants to see better bus services and connectivity across the state with a focus on the West to increase public transport use, reduce emissions and create local jobs. 
It calls for 10-minute frequencies and 100% electric buses in the West and upgraded bus connectivities statewide. Wyndham supports these aims as they align with our advocacy position. Looking forward, the ability to adapt and be flexible will continue to be important. Buses offer such flexible solutions and cost-effective transport solutions. They can utilise existing road infrastructure, virtual stops at your home, and could be running different ways, example of fixed or demand responsive services. There are a way to provide a public transport service in new growth areas early, where traditionally this would not have been possible until the road network was built out. There is huge possibility for us. We would welcome this style of service to, del to deliver bus uh, services early. It was great to see that the DRT referenced in the recently released state government bus plan and the desire to trial and innovate. In terms of community health and wellbeing, public transport buses are seen as a key factor in addressing the road toll and a move to cleaner buses will help address air quality concerns in our urban areas. Like many councils, we're finalising our advocacy strategy going forward and ahead of the upcoming elections. And for us, there is no secret that buses will be on that list. Uh, next slide, and just a thank you for, um, for your time. Thank you, Councillor Hagerpitch. The next panellist is Councillor Sarah Race. Councillor Race was elected to the Manningham Peninsula Shire Council in 2020 and was elected as deputy mayor in the same year. Councillor Race has a Bachelor of Arts degree in politics and history and is currently studying for a Master of Politics and International Relations. Her career background includes working across the e-commerce, tourism, and community development in industries. Welcome, Councillor Race. Over to you now. Excellent, thank you. And I'll just get the technology to work, so um, hold on. Okay. Hold well on. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, right. Uh, lovely to see you all. Yes, as Anna said, I'm um, Councillor Sarah Race. I'm Deputy Mayor of um, Mornington Peninsula Shire. I'm very lucky uh, to be so. I think uh, before I was a councillor, I just thought buses were a thing to get you from A to B um, and a, quite an efficient way to do it. I used to live in London and um, would catch the buses everywhere. everywhere. But um, uh, since becoming a councillor, I've realised actually buses are a really important community development tool. They get people to education opportunities. They get people to social opportunities. They get people to work. And uh, what we realised down on the Mornington Peninsula, without, this, without these services, it's really difficult to connect our people sometimes. So I'm talking today about our Better Buses advocacy, the our Better Buses campaign that we actually um, did in 2019. So even before I was a councillor, but I was very aware of the campaign. It was very pervasive across the peninsula. Uh, Councillor Race, um, just so you know, your speaking notes are also visible to us. I'm oh, sure there's okay. nothing uh, surprising <laughs> in there. Uh, just oh. if you wish to make any changes as you're going along there. Oh, excellent. Okay, hold on. I'll go back. Um, right. What can you can you still what can you see now? Because what I've got uh, on my screens are quite different, actually. Uh, can we find something that says next slide? We've and to set the scene. So we've got your main screen. Um, oh and a smaller screen with your notes underneath, I believe. Oh, dear. That's not what you were supposed to get. But anyway. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> it's all see. good. It's oh, lovely. We get to yeah. see the inner workings of, uh, of a Mornington Peninsula councillor's own mind. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. Well, uh, let's go from this. Um, okay. So as most of you know that uh, the Mornington Peninsula is um, like an only an hour's drive from central Melbourne and uh, many of you might have come down here to experience our amazing cellar doors, breweries, farm gates, golf courses, hot springs, beaches, you know, it's amazing. But uh, the Shire has actually the second lowest provision of public transport out of the 31 councils in the greater Mel metropolitan area. 82% uh, of the peninsula is not serviced by public transport. 
and two out of our three major activity centres on the peninsula are not serviced by rail. The third has a, di a diesel service on a limited timetable that, that actually doesn't connect with the bus service, so it's, it's quite poor for us. Um, so with poor public transport access and lengthy travel times, our residents have become very car dependent. Also, with 7.5 million visitors annually, and that's expected to rise exponentially this summer, only 18% of the peninsula is serviced by public transport, so visitors have no choice but to drive on the peninsula. Um, congestions on our roads is very common during peak holiday periods. I'm not sure if any of you have driven down on the on Boxing Day, but it's absolutely rammed. And the photo here on this slide depicts Peninsula Link traffic heading towards Peninsula during summer. And my husband tells me that's what it's like on a Friday and um, Friday afternoon when he's coming home from work when he commutes to Melbourne. Um, so we developed our advocacy action plan for our Better Buses campaign, and I understand um, that Councillor Antonella Chelli, who might be online today, she was very integral to this and worked with the MTF on this as well. Our goal was for increased investment into bus services on the Mornington Peninsula. Our understanding of the state of play was that the Department of Transport was supportive of our stated priorities and understood the need. Therefore, the campaign objective is not simply to restate our priorities and why our council thinks they're important. We knew it was vital. The department knew it was vital. What we needed those decision makers to hear was that it's vital to the community of the Mornington Peninsula. That was the fundamental approach we took in designing the campaign. So our campaign objectives for the, was for the Victorian government to understand just how important public transport is to our community and to allocate funds. Then we identified our three key messages. The problem, so we've just covered that. Um, and then the impact, the lack of public transport impacts the community in different ways, according to their needs and stages of life. So the young, uh, we have, um, our youth tend to leave the peninsula between 15 and 25, because it's really difficult for them to access education and employment opportunities. The elderly, we have the second oldest uh, population um, in Victoria uh, behind Geelong and people with disabilities. I understand that um, I think it's 22% of all peninsula residents will experience a disability at some point. Um, the campaign drew out the way these different impacts manifested, which I'll come back to later. So due to the lack of public transport on the peninsula, our residents are almost six times less likely to travel to work by public transport from Greater Melbourne. So a mere 3% of Shire residents take public transport to work compared with 15% across Greater Melbourne. Um, so our solution was a fully integrated smart technology bus network. We worked with Ventura and the Department, on Trans on Department of Transport on a series of proposed bus route alterations, which became a core element of our campaign. So with our action plan set, we were launched in, in August of 2019. We developed a set of campaign materials, including an advocacy document outlining our requests and the proposed alterations, a video for our website, post boxes and postcards, selfie cards and posters, pull up banner artwork. And we ran a number of activities to demonstrate community support and to advocate to the state government for increased investment. Activities included promoting the campaign at various events, such as markets, forums, etc., displaying campaign material at various locations throughout the Shire, encouraging the community to write why they support our campaign and how the lack of public transport affects them, and community engagement via online and social media. Oh, of course, media releases and local newspaper advert advertising as well. The campaign ran through the summer of 2019-20 and as a result, a meeting occurred with the Minister for Public Transport requesting options for a two-year stage rollout and targeted feedback regarding on-demand and across peninsula bus service, which are still ongoing. And then in December 2020, the State Government announced a suite of improvements to peninsula bus routes based on the Shire's proposal. So what do we think worked? We had heard from many members of the community about their transport problems. And these individuals were willing to share their stories and they became the face of the campaign. For example, William, our widower, who has lived in Rye his entire life. He had recently surrendered his licence for declining health. To get his, to his medical appointment at Frankston Hospital, it would take him an hour and 40 minutes using two buses. That journey actually normally takes about 40 minutes in a car. Our 18-year-old George, who just got a cabinetry apprenticeship in Rosebud but lives in Hastings with his mum, he used to drive the 24-minute trip each day until a family car broke down and they could not afford the repairs. So he had to catch the bus to Frankston before catching another bus to Rosebud and finally a third bus out to the industrial estate. So his one-way commute was now three hours and unable to get him to work on time. 
These were real life scenarios and they shone a light on how the lack of public transport was impacting them and highlighting how broadly the impacts were manifesting in the community. The personal stories made it relatable. These were normal activities that were made extremely limited or difficult because of the lack of public transport options and travel times. Um, Councillor Race, we're having mm -hmm. a slight technical issue. We are stuck on one of your earlier slides. Oh, okay, sorry. That's Have you got right. my... Oh, okay, um, hold on. Let's see. Um, so we're we're is that way better? back at... Uh, I'm you... not sure. It might be that we just need to share your slides with everyone later. We're still back at the <laughs> pictures of your partner's commute home on a Friday evening. Oh, no, so... I wonder why that happened. Oh, so, sorry to interrupt your flow, but that's all right. Back to you, uh... just so you know we're not seeing what you might think we're seeing. Oh, okay, well, I hope it's interesting as <laughs> when I'm <Yes>. speaking. <laughs> oh, dear. Um, I wonder what happened there. Um, it's been suggested stop your share and restart the share. See if oh, that okay. keeps us in. Okay, let's try again. Fortunately, um, we've got some excellent technical <laughs> experts in the audience. Thank you, everyone. Uh, okay, well, how about if I just go with that? Does that, that work? That looks good. We've now got um, what You've worked got... personal stories up. So back yep. to you. Thank you, Councillor Race. Excellent. So we've done that. So I've shared those personal stories. Let's go. Um. So, as part of the campaign, the Shire had an overwhelming 92,500 people engage with it via social media and face-to-face -face discussions. This included 2,500 community members who wrote to us in support and completed surveys. This is the largest number of engagements the Shire has ever received for an advocacy campaign. And to put it in context, there are... Oh, there's 160, there are 167,000 residents on the peninsula. So this was a fantastic result and we put it down to the use of media and social media to spread our word. As mentioned, we ran social media campaigns with selfie cards and hashtags as well as media releases and advertising and these really got the word out and continued that momentum. And finally, we think the biggest success of this campaign was that it was community driven. We made materials available to make it easy for the community to get engaged with this issue. And we spread the message at community events to get their involvement. But ultimately, the community decided to get engaged, to share their stories, and they helped drive this campaign. Previously, the Shire had pushed facts and statistics to plead our case. And we had met with ministers and officials before to little benefit. But this time it was community driven and they got their message across and highlighted the impact this issue was having on their lives, which we think made a real difference for this campaign. And uh, there's a picture of me as uh, before I actually got elected. So I was um, uh, very much part advocating for this campaign on the other side of the fence. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you, Councillor Reis. Thank you. Our last panelist is Jura Malo. Jura's current role is coordinator transport for the city of Greater Geelong. Commencing at Big Road Southwest, Big for moving into the private sector at AECO Melbourne. Jura has always had a passion moving people from A to B quickly. That people enjoy the journey there and are safe so they can do it all over again. The city of Greater Geelong's transport team are tasked with managing the existing and growing communities in urban, rural, and coastal contexts. As the city grows, an increased demand for public and active transport infrastructure will be crucial to support more sure and sustainable transport movement in the future. Over to you, Jura. Thanks, Anna. Yes. Um, now, I haven't, I haven't got any slides and I'm, I'm mindful of time, so I'll try and um, cover off some of the points that I wanted to talk to uh, quickly so we can open up to, to anyone that has some questions. But... For those, for those uh, listening, um, most, most of you have hopefully travelled to, to beautiful Geelong, but just some, I guess, some context if, if you're not so familiar. Um, Geelong's, I guess, one of the, the largest um, and, and fastest growing regional um, cities in Victoria um, from a rural perspective um, outside of Metro Melbourne. Um, we've got some very active uh, growth areas that are, that are developing and, and building out at the moment. In addition to some of the planning that we've got going on for our northern and western growth areas, um, which to give you some context, uh, is essentially the sat scale and size of Ballarat um, that we're essentially bolting onto the side of Geelong. So there's a lot of growth happening in Geelong and that, that certainly brings some challenges in terms of how people move around um, 
but I guess what adds to that is the the scale of Geelong from a from a um, physical area perspective. Um, uh, in as you mentioned there, and in the intro, the the diverse nature of of Geelong. You know, we've got some very coastal areas such as along the Ballerine, you know, Ocean Grove and Point Lonsdale, St Leonard's, those sorts of things that that have their own character and and I guess community expectations. Then we've got very rural um, farming zones. Um, and then, of course, we've got urban Geelong, which is um, very much in a city in itself. So I guess with all of that brings brings some challenges um, and, and I guess how um, public transport and in particular buses um, come into that picture. Um, in terms of talking about our travel and movement uh, in Geelong, um, public transport mode share is, is really low, like like many major um, rural centres. Um, I think it's in and around 1.5% to 1.8% of our mode share. So such a, a small fraction and, and we um, likewise have um, a high reliance on, on private vehicles. Um, what system we do have uh, from a public transport perspective is we've got a we've got a passenger rail uh, which is the Melbourne line, Geelong Melbourne line that goes through from from Warrnambool through to Geelong at through, through to Geelong through to Melbourne, uh, which is obviously heavily used pre-COVID um, with a lot of people getting to and from Melbourne for work, um, and then I guess from a public transport that services the community within Geelong um, is heavily heavily relied upon. Um, of the bus network um, that PTB provide. We did have trams back in the day. Um, however, they were removed in, in, I think it was 1950s, 1956, I think it was, uh, which is a bit of a shame because we could really do with them right now. But um, as I mentioned, that sort of size and scale and diversity of Geelong um, brings about our biggest challenge being time competitiveness for the community. Um, similar to, I think, Councillor Race, you were talking about some of those examples. Um, we have we have very much similar um, sort of challenges. You know, someone to get from Ocean Grove uh, on the coast into Geelong would be about a 25-minute uh, car trip if they were to take their private vehicle. To catch a bus would take them over an hour. Um, so the feasibility and, and viability of someone um, making that choice uh, for public transport um, is really difficult uh, when you've got those sorts of barriers. Um, likewise, in and around urban, more or less urban Geelong, um, if you were to go from a, a suburb such as Heighton into, into the CBD in Geelong, it'd be about a 15, conservatively, a 15 minute car ride and, and a bus trip would take you uh, in and around uh, half an hour to 40 minutes. Um, and it's not a direct service either, either which um, which is making that challenge even more uh, greater. Um, I think it was Ian that was, was speaking earlier, which resonated really similarly to Geelong also, is around um, the percentage of trips uh, within short distances. Um, I think it's 80 something percent of trips within five kilometres of central Geelong are made by private vehicles, um, which isn't great, but prevents with that sort of challenge presents a really great opportunity in terms of um, if there's alternate services um, that really meet those expectations and needs of the community, you know, they're the, they're the low hanging fruit, I think, um, in terms of focus for um, public transport, buses um, and active transport that plays a, a big part in that, I think. Um, the way in which uh, Geelong's bus network is currently set up is that we're a very centralised uh, service. Um, there's uh, approximately 20 services that um, bus services or bus routes, I should say, that service uh, urban Geelong and uh, all of those go um, from those suburbs into the CBD. Um, so something that we're really interested in exploring and, and getting PTB to explore some more is about um, leveraging our, our passenger rail uh, network so that we can have a decentralised uh, service that can be a lot more efficient, a lot more direct um, and uh, can hopefully get to people also to some of their more local uh, community centres um, a lot more efficiently. There's four things I just wanted to cover off in terms of where I think some of um, some of the challenges and key opportunities are for Geelong, but I think a lot of these apply to um, some of the particularly potentially you know places like you were um, talking, Councillor Adele, about the uh, about Wyndham, but also you know similar 
large scale uh, rural urban um, you know major major rural centers that are they're really stuck in between because um, they don't quite fit the rural mode, which is what uh, you know PTV essentially provide uh, from a servicing perspective. Um, but we're not included in the metro um, sort of scheme either, um, you know. And I think that's something that really is something that needs to be looked into a bit more because um, there's more and more of those as as um, the state is growing. Those those rural centres are growing, um, and they're not just the rural townships that they used to be um so they don't fit the mold of, of either of those um sort of sort of services um or the way in which the services are structured for geelong you know we've got all the right strategic elements um to support sustainable transport um and and really leverage active and public transport um a key one for us as an example is our clever and creative future uh, which was developed in partnership with the community which aspires by 2051 that 50% of our mode share um, will be made up by sustainable means, so either public transport or active transport. So, you know, from, from, from that perspective, you know, we've got a lot um, behind us from a strategic sense. The third thing is probably just around um, appreciating that um, when we talk about transport, it's just as much as a technical subject as it is a behavioural science, you know, where... There's the component of build it and they will come, um, but we've also got to think about the, the, the perspective of a lot of this requires community change. Um, and in order to do that, we need to think about those behavioural elements um, and what needs to happen to support community um, to make that change. Um, it's not just to put buses on and to, to have, you know, um, certain infrastructure elements that, that encourage them to do it. It's about how do we actually change that behaviour. So I think that's one thing to really think about. And just finally, before I finish up, the last was around, um, you know, in the context of community, local councils are arguably the closest level of government to a community. So uh, often we're left trying to fill gaps um, to, the, to the expectations and needs of community. And so, um, and when those gaps do occur, it's, it's sort of, we're sort of looked to first um, I think to fill them, um, and then often that means we start playing and and and, and dabbling in um, things that are not necessarily the role or responsibilities of of council. Um, and so, you know, that's something for us to consider. How do we how do we advocate and and, and partner better with um, our state government partners and whatnot to get this, these sort of things moving? Um, a classic example for us in Geelong at the moment is um, bus shelters. You know. Um, we, um, as, a, as a council, own and maintain uh, close to 500 bus shelters across the municipality. Um, we're not funded uh, to, to really do that um, or to provide that service to the community. Um, and so that's essentially an infrastructure item, an asset, and everything else that goes with that um, in terms of the customer service base of it and everything um, that we're providing for a service that we don't necessarily um, own um, so it's a real challenge um, from that perspective as well but um, I'll leave it there because I'm mindful I want to I want to leave some time um, for, for anyone that has some questions of, of either of the uh, of the panel. Thank you Jura. Now it is the exciting question time. I'll kick off uh, first and the political environment is an important element for an advocacy campaign. Will you advocate? during the state election campaign next year? And how will you adapt if the elected local member is from the opposition? So who would like to take this question? Councillor Reyes or Councillor Hagerpich? Councillor Reyes can go first, if you like. Thanks. <laughs> uh, actually, uh, what we've found handy, our uh, local uh, one of our local state MPs Chris Brain who's down the pain ward he's actually quite young and he uh, understands how awful our bus system is so he used to have to catch a couple of buses to get to his job before he actually became an MP so he's been uh, quite a strong advocate but we will definitely make public transport a key advocacy position for um, for the peninsula going into the next election cycle because it's it's vitally important. I think the, the, probably the statistics and stuff I read out this, the, um, today highlighted the, the real issue. And we're actually, I think, 
um, as Jared was talking about uh, rural urban settings, the Mornington Peninsula definitely sees ourselves as peri-regional and we really have to talk about those issues that we have as this, this kind of hybrid sort of situation. Um, we don't have a cross-peninsula bus and that hampers so much, of our, so, min, so much of our connectivity. So we'll definitely be looking at that as a piece of advocacy. Thank you, Councillor Ruth. Councillor Hackett, yes? Yeah, from our perspective, uh, Wyndham's a, a safe labour seat. So uh, for us, it's not really a situation of um, what's happening with the, uh, with the opposition. Having said that, though, we always keep um, uh, good relations with our um, opposition leaders because we never know when they're going to be in, um, in, in power. So for us, Wyndham City has had a strong advocacy and intergovernmental relations on the agenda for many months. And so we'll just continue to refine and review our approach uh, to that. Um, to ensure that we continue meeting the needs of our community. For us, that means, you know, a pub, another, it could potentially mean another public campaign. Uh, we'll continue with the for, formal submissions, some meetings with their ministers, uh, opposition, members of parliament, um, and, of course, the advisors. And we just continue having good ongoing relationship with um, key government departments. That's our, where we, that, that for us is the most important part of any advocacy campaign. Thank you. And Jen, do we have any questions from the audience? Jane's on mute. Thank you very much for that heads up. <laughs> oh, three hours of Zoom, it's doing me and everyone. Um, we have a question from Councillor Tom Mellican at the City of Banyul, um, which has also come up in the, the chat, which is around previously when coming out of restrictions, we had a COVID-free Melbourne. This time we will have a COVID-safe Melbourne and people have avoided public transport. People have embraced more cycling during COVID. What are we going to do to ensure that that continues? I'll, I'll maybe kick off because... Um... I'm actually really obviously interested and active in this space um, from an officer perspective. Um, and I think there was some there's some information that I think was the Amy Gillett Foundation uh, put out um, around uh, the interest of, of people, particularly cycling post-COVID. Um, and I can't, I can't remember the numbers, but it was it was it was massive. Um, and I certainly think it's something that we need to leverage. Um, I know in, in Geelong, from, from a Geelong's perspective, we've got some, some major um, separated infrastructure going in uh, from an active transport cycling perspective, um, which, which we know, um, I think it's 64% of people, um, you know, are really interested in cycling, but don't feel safe to do so. Um, and so we really need to look at active transport infrastructure from a safety perspective, um, it's not catering for your people in Lycra. It's catering for, for your mums and dads um, that want to get to work um, or the kids that want to sort of ride to school and those sorts of things. So that user profile, I think, is really important to have front and centre of mind when we're thinking about active transport. And it's, it's certainly going to be a big part of, um, from a Geelong's perspective, I think, um, like many other areas in the state, for sure. Uh, Councillors, did you wish to add? Yeah, I'll add something to that. Um, I, one thing that came out of the our Get Wind and Moving campaign when we did it back in 2015 or 16 when the actual uh, race, we did a race to the city mm. and bikes actually made it ahead um, of any other form of transport into the city. So for us, that was a uh, something to take away. So something that's come of it since then, we've been um, trying to connect up those missing links for both walking and cycling um, and in that active transport but also at the moment what we're advocating for is it's all great to ride if when we get to the train station there's nowhere to park the bike. So we're, we're currently advocating for better um, bu bus lockers at the uh, train stations because at the moment the ones that they're um, proposing are not uh, satisfactory. So for us, um, we're working in that space at the moment uh, to ensure that cycling becomes a, a priority in our area. Thank you. And Councillor Race? Yeah, our active transport is uh, really high on the list of priorities for our residents. And I think more so since COVID, possibly, when they realise actually the peninsula doesn't actually have that many footpaths. Mm -hmm. And so uh, there's a big call on us now to, to look at our pedestrian um, 
network strategy and where those footpaths are actually going because more people I think more people came and lived down here during COVID as well and they're used to having more urban infrastructure and they come to a coastal seaside town without like without footpaths and they're quite shocked at how few we have we also actually have a uh, quite a um I guess active a group of people who are really looking for the Peninsula Trail to be to be finished to have those missing links. So we're looking at also at that as a really big piece of advocacy. I'll go back now to you, Councillor Chen, for your your final question. Remember, your panelists, you had oh, a, yeah, you have a yeah. heads up. Hopefully, you can work to that. So back to you, Councillor Chen. I have another question, and um, it is predicted that COVID restrictions, such as social distance. Uh, social distancing and hygiene will contribute to the rise in future car use. So how might you adjust your advocacy strategy? So I will start with Councillor Hagedich. Would that be all right with you? Yeah, that's fine. I gave the last one to Councillor Ray, so that's fine. <laughs> um, for us, it's not about changing necessarily advocacy strategy. We, uh, as I mentioned in my presentation, we're crying out for more public transport options here in Wyndham. So for us, um, it's continuing that in that space. It's about advocating for new responsive styles of public transport service so that we've got greater coverage in our growth areas. And that for us is um, what, what we're going to be doing so that we can, um, you know, continue working in that space. So we, we're trying to advocate for the, to meet our needs of our community and that's just what we do on a daily basis. Yeah. How about Councillor Reese? I think yeah, we're very, I yeah. I think we're very similar, actually. I don't think we, we we just don't have enough public transport at all to meet the needs of our community. So, and I, I think I probably missed this part of the question before. We we actually have three state MPs, and a couple, um, two of our seats are very marginal. So we have a really great, powerful position to advocate from, and so we will be continuing our advocacy. And we actually put a hundred thousand dollars in this year's budget to look at um, demand on demand bus services. So I'm really looking forward to seeing how that works in our space because that could be a really innovative ideas but but yeah we're just going to keep advocating 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 for more buses so how about your giraffe uh, yeah. officer's perspective officer perspective i guess uh, it's one thing to look at um i guess the rationale uh to do um bus services but i guess the other perspective is to look at the cost of not doing it you know if if, if we don't do this sorts of things what sort of future are we then setting ourselves up for um, and I don't think that's really necessarily a space, an environment or a place we all want to live where, um, where we don't have some of the, the benefits that come from public transport and active transport. So I think putting our minds to that uh, would, be, would be something I think uh, would, from an advocacy message perspective, would be really valuable. Yeah, thank you. So panellists, we are getting close to the end of the session. I still remember the three words takeaway advice for our audience. So, and uh, how about we start with Councillor Hagedich, uh, three words advice for our audience. A sustained strategic approach. Terrific. Councillor Race. A community-driven approach. Three words, yes. Gerard. <laughs> I've actually, um, I've actually nailed mine down to, to two, and that's just to think differently. Those are all together six plus two, eight words. that offer <laughs> fantastic, fantastic advice. So over to you. Uh, over back to Chair Councillor Mustang. Thank you, everyone. We'll just get um, Councillor Marsden back on the panel.